Uh, you can see the, the, the counties of the 254 counties in Texas, we saw 91 of those counties actually lost population over, those, over that seven year period. And they're all listed in pink here. Basically, in some of these areas in Far East Texas, if you are not inheriting the family farm and you have any prospects of having any prospects, guess what? You're going to move to another city within Texas uh, or another city in general. 87% uh, of our population right now is in this, uh, is, is east of I-35, and 67% of that total population is in what we call that urban triangle. This is Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, uh, San Antonio, and Austin, everywhere in between in those markets there. The forecast for the next uh, uh, 30 plus years uh, is that 90% or more of that population will be in the urban triangle. Uh, you can see how these cities are in blue, those are the ones that are expected to, the dark blue, gain somewhere between a million and three and a half million people. Uh, those are all going to go to all of these big cities within the great state of Texas. Where is our population coming from? Uh, it's, it's actually more international than I originally thought it was going to be, so this kind of surprised me. Uh, but about half, it's split about half or a little over half is domestic migration, so people moving from other states in the United States to Texas, and about 30% uh, to 50%, depending on the year, is international migration. So you can see some of the trends over the years have been going more from the international side to more of the domestic side in terms of immigration. So this is a lot of what's driving the people that are moving here. So it's, we, are, we are a very international uh, state uh, here in Texas. Uh, the full year statistics when it comes to how many properties that we sold in Texas, 2019 versus 2018. And the month of December of 2019, we sold 29,000 units, which was a 12.5% increase year over year, which is extreme. Uh, and it's extreme as you look at the average or the total year over year increase for all of Texas which was only 3.8% increase in year over year closed sales, which is pretty typical with about what most of the year looked like here in Texas. When it came, comes to average price, we saw a 6.5% increase in average price, which put us in the month of December over that $300,000 mark. Year to date, all or the average for all of 2019 was about 290, uh, 292,000, which was a 3.2% increase versus what we, uh, what our price was in 2018. The only market segment of the single family condos and townhouses that went down were the condo market. So the condo market saw a 7.8% year over year reduction, and um, we were seeing. Uh, a lot of that reduction throughout the year. At the end, end of the year, for example, in December, the numbers were up, but still not up enough to pull up the whole rest of the year. One of the things that we're experiencing, experiencing, and this is not just in Texas, but this is really throughout the greater United States, because we've seen housing prices go up significantly over the last five to 10 years, uh, is that the household income is not keeping up with the median household price. So right now, or going back to 1989, for example, the median <coughs> household price as a function of household income was 2.65 times your median household income. Jumping to 2018, that number jumped to 3.89 times that median household income. So it's a pretty big jump, and you can see specifically how these lines start to pull away from each other even more as we get into 2011. Now, one of the big things that's allowing that, guys, go ahead and sit down anywhere. Uh, one of the big things that's allowing that pull away is the fact that we have very low inventory, is the fact that we have a lot of demand and by way of all of these people moving here, and is also the fact that we've had very low interest rates. These low interest rates have allowed the prices to float up without allowing the monthly mortgage payments to float up. So even though we want to say like we buy houses based on how much they cost, we really base, because we're getting mortgages, we buy mostly based on how much we can afford. So even though this is a big jump over the last several years, and even though it's not keeping up, 
we are still in a position where these houses are still affordable for us. Now, and just to give it a little bit more perspective and make it relative to something, if, for example, you go back to California in 2005, in California in 2005, this number was not three times, this number was not four times, this number was over six times the median uh, household income. So what we're seeing now is going up, but it's not going up at the same rate that it's gone up in the past. Again, one of the things that has allowed this to float and encouraged this to float is the fact that we have very little inventory right now in Texas. So our average or our balance market is about six months of inventory. Uh, going back, and this chart goes back to 2001, you can see where we were kind of in that sweet spot of inventory for a long time. You can see when the credit boom came in and we went below that six months of inventory. And then you can see the credit bust in the Great Recession where we went up to almost nine months of inventory here in this Texas market. In 2012, that's when we became went back into a seller's market again. And we've been in that seller's market since uh, 2012 very consistently. And we've been in this three to four months of uh, inventory throughout the state of Texas. Uh, some cities within Texas are much lower than others. Uh, for example, in Austin, the city of Austin, it's closer to about, uh, less, it's actually less than two months of inventory. In Houston, for example, that number is closer to about three and a half to four months of inventory. So there's a little bit of variation there. Austin is pulling down the curve when it comes to the months of inventory, which is also one of the reasons why Austin is pulling up the curve when it comes to the average and medium prices. Uh, because this is basic economics of supply and demand. As demand goes up and supply goes down, those prices start to go up. That's just kind of a natural phenomenon that we see. Uh, when you break down the market throughout Texas of the inventory of homes for sale, you can see uh, where we are in the United States right now. We ended 2019 at three and a half months. In Texas, we also ended at three and a half months. In Austin, uh, and this is the Austin larger metro area, not just the city of Austin, but the Austin larger metro area, 2.1 months. Historically, this number has averaged uh, from 1990 to 2018. This number has averaged close to closer to 4.3 months of inventory. So that's the, our closer balanced market, somewhere between four and five months of inventory. But right now, we're at about half of what that is. And again, that's why we're seeing those average prices float up uh, so dramatically. We also seeing very low months of inventory throughout the other major cities uh, in the state. But again. Austin's kind of pulling down the curve when it comes to that total. Uh, so so if after all this time, since uh, 2012, we have been in a seller's market, the question sometimes becomes, well, why aren't we building more houses? It would just make sense, and now we'd be good. Uh, the truth is we are building more houses, but we're, not, we're still not building as many houses in this economic cycle as what we built in the last economic cycle. So what does that look like? Uh, this chart goes back to 1990, so you can see the run-up again that we had with the credit boom, the run-up uh, we had with the credit bust and the Great Recession. We bottomed out at building about uh, 68,000 houses a year. Right now, we're, we're building and forecasted to build about 130,000 houses. At our height, we were building 166,000 houses in the last market cycle in 2004, 5, and 6 time frame. So even though we're selling more houses today than what we sold in 2005, 2006, et cetera, we're still building uh, significantly fewer houses. And this is impacting us from the standpoint of we are not seeing the, uh, 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 we're not seeing that inventory rebound. And then it's impacting us from the standpoint of we are seeing those average and median prices float up so much. Uh, now, why would you think that a builder, if the opportunity is there from the standpoint of uh, we, we have buyers, right? So why, why, wouldn't you be, why wouldn't you be building? There is and has been and is forecasted to be a demographic shift, so we're already seeing it, uh, moving from single family to moving over to multifamily. And I'm going to show you a chart in uh, the next couple of slides where you'll see how much more multifamily we're building today than what we built in the last market cycle. 
We've recovered on multifamily in terms of the number of builds. We have not recovered on single family. In truth, we need to be building both uh, asset uh, classes, uh, but right now there's a bigger appetite for multifamily than single family. This chart is uh, for uh, uh, the annual number of home sales. You can see where we've been again going back to 1990, boom, bust, and then where we are today. So right now, we are selling more houses today than what we sold, for example, in the 2006 time frame, uh, but we are building fewer houses. We're building about 40,000 fewer houses today, even though we're selling more. So again, there is there is that disruption that's happening in the market, and that disruption is creating some of these uh, uh, larger price increases uh, in the market that we've seen, not just in Austin, but also throughout the rest of Texas. The multifamily building permits, so this is where you can see where we have caught up uh, versus where we were. So again, this chart goes back to 1990. You can see some of the buildup that we had in the dot-com boom, a little uh, pull down in the dot-com bust, the credit boom, and then the credit bust of the Great Recession. But you can see starting in roughly 2012, we were building almost as many units as what we had built in 2005 and 2006. So the multifamily market recovered much faster when it comes to the number of properties that they were adding, the number of properties they were putting down. There was also more people to go into multifamily as we were, there were many more foreclosures. As the delinquency rate in foreclosures was about 10 plus percent in 2005 versus right now it's about two and a half percent. So as people are, are getting foreclosed on, do you think they have a big appetite to go out and buy another brand new house right away? And the answer is, well, not only do they not have the appetite, but they also can't. So that's one of the reasons, too, you're seeing more people move into multifamily. And then you're also seeing the millennials, right? So the millennials have a different um, appetite when it comes to what they want and what they see as success. So as a Gen Xer, success is a big house in the suburbs. As a millennial, success is more a condo downtown that's close to everything that they love. So as the demographics shift, a lot of the building has shifted. Now, I think some of the thought process still needs to be re reworked in terms of still continuing to add many of those single family homes. But right now, more of the focus uh, is on that, multi, that multi-family asset class. Uh, when you look at employment growth rate, uh, Texas versus the United States, uh, Texas is uh, in, in red. Uh, so you can see the amount of employment growth rate we've had. Uh, and then we have the United States in black. So Texas is always pretty much dwarfing the rest of the greater United States in terms of as a percentage. Uh, right now, Texas is adding at a rate of about 2.6%. Um, which is about that 250 plus thousand new jobs a year uh, versus the greater United States is only adding at about 1.1%. So we're all familiar, right? Everyone here is all familiar that everyone is moving to Texas. Uh, if, you're, if you're curious about it, just, just go out. Uh, let's see. Well, it is 830. Um, but probably still go out on Mohawk or I-35 and it's probably still a, pretty much a parking lot. And it is, I think, 24-7 now because of the employment growth as well as the population growth uh, that are uh, coming together uh, to create some of both the disruptions that are positive as well as some of the traffic disruptions, which I think are a little bit negative. Uh, unemployment rate and the trends that we're seeing. So again, this chart goes back to 2008. You can see where unemployment jumped up for the United States to about 10%. Uh, here in Austin, for example, it only jumped up to about uh, 7%. Uh, right now, we're all converging on as close to zero when it comes to the unemployment rate as we have ever had. Uh, so right now, here in Austin, we have a 2.7% unemployment rate. Uh, just to let you guys know, the government considers full employment an unemployment rate that's about 6%, so congratulations, you guys are all fully employed. Uh, here in Austin, if you do not have a job, it's because, well, quite frankly, you don't want a job. Uh, right now, we are uh, seeing an inversion in the curve that is the number of, of, uh, number of positions open, so the number of job wanted ads, versus the number of people that are employed. 
So we have more job openings and we have people that are unemployed. And that's not just true for Austin, although it's really true for Austin, but it's also true for Texas and much of the greater United States as well. The job growth by Metro, so Austin is leading the pack here as a percent, uh, but not in total. So uh, Dallas-Fort Worth is usually adds about 100,000 new jobs a year. Uh, Houston, depending on where they are in their market cycle, which is still determined very much by what happens in oil and gas. Uh, when oil and gas was trading at over $110 a barrel, Houston was hiring over 110,000 people a year. When oil and gas started trading at $36 a barrel, then uh, Houston was only hiring about 30 to 40,000 people a year. In Austin, even though as a percentage we, are high, we have higher uh, uh, growth rate, we're only still uh, uh, adding about 30 to 35,000 jobs a year. But as a whole, as a percentage, uh, it is what's pulling up everything else uh, here in the Texas market. One of the things that we hear a lot of, or that we worry a lot here about in Austin, is a lot of talk about, and everyone says, uh, Austin is, Austin's unaffordable. Austin's no longer affordable. And that is true that Austin has always been one of the highest and most expensive markets out there, especially of all the Texas markets. Uh, but if you look at where we stand versus the greater United States in terms of the uh, housing affordability, uh, we're right in line with all things United States. So that is a that is a positive, right? And that kind of gives you a little different perspective. But um, uh, in this particular chart, uh, Austin is, is, is the green line and the United States is the, the black line. Uh, so you can see the greater United States went what became very affordable, right, in 2006 when the market crashed. But what happened in, during, when the market crashed here in Austin? Didn't really change average prices. So average prices kind of stayed up here. So in this time period, it looked like that Austin was more expensive. But as the market has recovered, they both converged on being about the same average uh, price as an, uh, uh, about the same average price. The big difference I would I would suggest to you guys is that the cost of living here in Austin and the quality of life here in Austin is much higher than any place where you might have to be shoveling snow uh, and putting up with many other kind of things that might be a little uncomfortable like that. Uh, the median home price trend. Uh, so Austin definitely is more expensive than the rest of, of Texas. The Austin market is the market that actually pulls up the curve in terms of increasing the average and median price here in Texas. Uh, you can see that Austin's been growing at a higher rate than the rest of Texas as well. Right now, our average, uh, pardon me, our median price in uh, the Austin area is 314,000 versus the average or median price in the Texas uh, market about 255,000. And you can see how it's grown from in 2005, 15 years ago, uh, being closer to about 200,000. So in the last 15 years, on average, that median price has jumped up uh, about $115,000. If you look at just specifically the city of Austin, that number is significantly higher. Uh, but right now, but uh, for this chart, we're looking at the five county uh, major area, uh, major cities around the Austin area. Uh, so how does it look for us in the economic environment and the business environment? It's still really strong here. So we are been many, many years into uh, this economic cycle. So you can see uh, the economic cycle here in Austin turned around in roughly 2010, 2011. And since that point, we have been above what we call our long-term average growth range, which here in Austin is about 6%. We have had higher uh, so, some, some times that we were even significantly above that. And uh, that last year, we ended at basically that 6% mark. So very strong performance. Uh, again, going back to the 2011-2012 timeframe for us here in the Austin market. And all systems and all forecasts are still go for us here in Austin to continue this phase uh, of the market cycle or the business index cycle and the growth that we're seeing. But we're not seeing anything that's really gonna propel us to the next level. We're not seeing anything that's gonna grow us from a 6% range to a, uh, an 
8% range or a 9% range. We're just gonna continue to be uh, slow and steady. Some of the economists refer to it uh, as decelerated growth. So the good news that I have to share with you is that number is still positive, uh, but it's not maybe going to be as positive as it's been in the past. Tons of seats here, please grab one. Uh, make yourself comfortable, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what, are, what are we watching in terms of the United States market, in terms of the Texas market, and in terms of the Austin market? Uh, in the Austin market specifically, the limited, affordability, uh, the limited inventory uh, combined with the decrease in affordability. So um, again, it's, it, 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 if you look at actually what we make here in Austin versus what the rest of Texas makes as well, we make here, we make more money here, right? So it does, it, it, people can afford a little bit more uh, expensive house. But as we have, again, that reduction in inventory and it's so consistent, we are gonna see that increase in price and these uh, issues are gonna continue to compound on each other. Uh, corporate moves, uh, we have uh, a lot of companies that are relocating here and or setting up uh, uh, their main offices here. Uh, we've had Apple obviously announce the 5,000 employees and they're going to expect it to go to about 1,500 employees. Uh, Smile Direct, I think that's in the beauty market. Uh, Republic, they're a liquor uh, franchise. It's 300 people in the Pflugerville market. And again, right now we have more job openings than we do have the number of people uh, unemployed. So this will continue to be a hot job market for us in Austin, which is something that will continue to allow our average price to float up and still have it be affordable as those wages continue to go as well. Now, uh, last year, more so last year than this year, uh, but last year there was a lot of talk about the uh, possibility, uh, uh, not the possibility, but it was a lock that we were going to have increase in interest rates, right? Uh, we did see some increase in interest rates at the end of 2018, uh, but when they brought them right back down and interest rates stayed basically flat through all of 2019, although there was some fear that we were going to see those interest rates go up because there was some fear that the economy was starting to get a little overheated. Once the economy starts to feel a little overheated, they try to rein it in with economic policy, specifically raising the interest rate to pull it back in line. Right now, what's the Fed opinion of uh, the economic environment that we're in? They say that everything looks pretty good. We don't, have, we don't see a reason that would uh, make us increase those interest rates. So that's a good sign for us because for every 1% increase in interest rates, we see up to 11% decrease in the affordability, how much we can pay on a monthly basis. So what that means is if, if today at a 4% interest rate, just using round numbers, we can afford a $330,000 house. If interest rates go up 1% from 4% to 5%, now based on that same, based on a monthly payment, now we can only afford a house that's about $300,000. So does that have an impact on us? The answer is yes. Now I want to say that and make sure I don't uh, make any indication to the fact that there is a correlation between interest rates and housing prices. Everyone thinks, of course there's an inter correlation between interest rates and housing prices. Interest rates go up, housing prices go down. But if you look at it historically, for example, if you go back to the 80s when interest rates were 12%, uh, 15%, 18%, were housing prices going down? No, they were going up. In fact, people were rushing like, oh, I better lock this 15% interest rate long because I hear it's going up to 17%, right? And then when interest rates uh, have jumped up and down and up and down, you'll see that there's the, the R score, <coughs> the statistical variation, the correlation between the interest rate and housing prices, there is none. But there is a high statistical correlation between housing prices and time, right? Inflation. So that's one thing I want you guys to be aware of. Uh, there is usually a little gasp in the market when interest rates do go up and we usually do see a small decrease in the number of housing sales, but we don't see it so impactfully that we see an immediate decrease in the average housing prices. In fact, we don't see it at all, especially when you look at it over the long term. Um, now, the other thing that does, in addition to time, 
a backed housing crisis is it, are, are, are these two things. Um, in migration, so we're forecasted to basically double our population over the next 30 years, just like we've doubled our population uh, since every 30 years since Texas became part of the great United States of America, except for two different 30 year periods where we came really, really, really close. Okay? So if people stopped moving to Texas, yes, we would see a decrease in housing prices in the same way that we're seeing decreases in housing prices in other states where people are moving out of, right? That makes sense. And if people stopped having families and having babies, then yes, we would see a decrease in our housing prices. But none of those things are predicted for us, neither in the short term nor in the long term. Uh, what else? Uh, concerns about the general economy. Again, this was more of a fear in 2019 necessarily than it is in 2020. But again, as we're 127 months into an economic expansionary period, and the average expansionary period is 60 months, a lot of people worry, well, something's about anything could happen any moment. So there are some concerns that something is going to happen, uh, and um, uh, that, that might affect uh, our housing market. Uh, uh, and to, just to also point out the fact that it is more than double what our typical economic expansionary period is. So that makes a lot of people nervous. But again, if you look at the uh, country of Australia, you'll find that they are 29 years into economic expansion. If they can do it, we can. Uh, and then some of the other things that we're seeing, stock market uh, volatility, uh, that makes everyone nervous at all the time. And, and, and this last bullet point, I know everyone's going to think I'm a little, I've got a little cuckoo, uh, but I'm just going to put it out there because even Apple on Tuesday, what, what, what was their earnings announcement on Tuesday? Warning is slowing. It's a warning. It's a slowing. Why? Because the, the, the boxes that we put our stuff in and the electronics that we get is coming from China. What's going on with our factories? They're shut down. Yeah. Okay. Is that going to have an impact on our stock market? If you look at what happened with Apple stock the very next day, what happened? Oh, it went down, right? Now, did it have to rebound? I mean, because the stock market, you can't really necessarily make rhyme or reason out of it in the same way that you can make rhyme and reason out of the housing market. Uh, but the coronavirus is something that could be very impactful for us. Uh, and, and the other way that we will directly see it here in Texas is because many of these uh, factories are shut down, what are they using less of? Besides everything, clearly, but gas, right? So what has happened with uh, price per barrel over the last month or so? It's gone from trading in the mid to high 50s to trading at about $52 a barrel. Will that impact uh, the businesses in Houston? The answer is yes, absolutely. Because all of 2019, they were trading oil and gas, uh, price per barrel was around $60 a barrel. So this is a pretty big haircut, right? This is a, a 10 to 15% haircut over the, uh, over the profits that they were making, for example, in 2019. So as that demand goes down, right, supply and demand, just like in the housing markets, when low supply, uh, high demand, prices go up, now we have higher supply of oil and gas, a reduction in demand for oil and gas, which means the, those prices are starting to go down. So does that have an effect on us here in Texas? Yes, it does, uh, for sure. Uh, trade war, uh, again, more news uh, the second half of 2019. Uh, but the big thing that, that we're all watching is, is the fact that we are in a presidential election year. When we go into presidential election years, is everyone like, hey, I want to make a move today? No, everyone's like, let's kind of wait and see what happens before we make any big decisions, whether that's sometimes big purchases, uh, whether that's changing jobs, whatever, whatever it may be. Um, now, to be clear, uh, and over the last 10 years, we have gone through an election cycle, right? And did we have a decrease in the number of uh, home sales? No, we didn't. Do we have a decrease in the price? No, we didn't. Why is that? Because people are still moving to Texas because we have great job growth, right? Because we have low unemployment and because we have more job openings and we have a number of people employed, right? So even though it's an election year, even though people are kind of like, well, let's see what happens. Uh, and even though uh, the, the president we elect that could have some significant impacts on 
uh, on us from an economic standpoint as well as from a housing standpoint uh, is these are all things we're watching but it's like oh that's that's kind of interesting as opposed to we're watching and this is going to have a direct impact on us per se again if people stop moving here we're gonna have a problem for sure but that's not the case uh, probability of a recession so again this is the other you know when, when is this shoe gonna drop when are we gonna get out of 120 months of economic expansion uh, there are a couple of indicators that that that, that they have seen a correlation between uh, these economic indicators and the likelihood, the probability, and the actual uh, historical recessions. So that big one is something called the inversion of the yield curve, specifically the three-month treasury note versus the 10-year treasury note. Historically, the three-month treasury note comes at a lower interest rate than the 10-year treasury note because, hey, we know what's going to happen in the next three months, and we feel pretty comfortable about that, and we feel pretty safe. So there's less risk to us. But when you have in your 10-year in your treasury note, well, who, no one knows what's going to happen in the next 10 years, right? So that one usually comes at a higher interest rate. Over the last... Uh, nine months, we have seen an inversion in that yield curve. So we're seeing the 10-year note going at a lower rate than the three-month. Now, well, that just doesn't make any good sense, right? So when we stop making good sense, right, sometimes that has historically in the last market cycle, that was a big predictor of us going into a recession. Now, it has gone up, but it has not gone up, and we have not been making, uh, how am I going to say this? Uh, uh, we're making better uh, sense than we did in the last in the last market. So we're doing less crazy things. Um, so even though that that is something that's increased over the last uh, uh, nine to twelve months, it has not increased at the same level that we've seen it increase at before. So still watching it uh, uh, very closely uh, to to see to see where that where that ends up landing. Uh, but. Uh, Right now, I think we're still okay, and at least for the next 12 months, at least in this market. Now, we are seeing uh, some changes in terms of our debt load. So, for the, we, and we do have more debt today in 2020 <coughs> than what we had in 2008. Uh, by a little bit more. But the thing that's changed is the composition of that debt. So it used to be, for example, going back to 2008, that a larger portion of, of our debt was mortgage debt. The composition has changed to where now a larger portion of, and, and, and not the largest portion, but, but we've seen more student debt than we've ever seen before. So since 2008, there's been a 126% increase in student loan debt, of which 11% of that debt is delinquent, which is a significant amount of debt that is delinquent. In fact, if you want to just to kind of put it in perspective for you, right now, mortgage loan debt, it's actually down. It's decreased 4%. And right now, that's only 2.5% delinquent. Now, in the last market cycle, for example, in 2005, 2006, mortgage debt did go up to about 10% delinquent. And that's when we got into crisis mode. Uh, some people say we're in crisis mode for student debt, and that's probably true, but the... Um, you know, lies, damn lies, and, and statistics. So the amount of student loan debt is so small in the overall scheme of our total debt that it's not gonna impact all of us as that debt starts to default. But you can see the yellow line is that student loan debt. The blue line is the mortgage debt. So even though we have more student loan debt, we still don't, it hasn't, it hasn't, and it will not eclipse the mortgage debt and the, obviously our total debt that we have. Uh, we've also seen a 51% increase in our auto loan debt. And most of this debt is actually of a lower quality, um, uh, uh, of a low, so we're, we're, we're lending money to less qualified people. I, I actually think this is all of the Uber drivers uh, that are out there right now. Uh, getting getting cars and driving people around is the only thing that I could sort of figure when it when it comes to that. But uh, uh, that's how our debt has changed. Uh, we have also seen a six percent decrease in credit card debt. 
even though we have, I think I want to say the average debt per person is like uh, almost fifteen thousand dollars, and that has been going up. It's still not up at the same rate that it was, for example, in two thousand eight. Now, seven point eight percent of that debt is delinquent, and that is significant. But again, as you look at that uh, credit card debt in orange, it's still dwarfed in comparison to all the mortgage debt, and even dwarfed in comparison to the now student loan debt uh, that many of us uh, have. Um, 29 sales data, so this is specifically for the Austin and Round Rock market. So I'm gonna show you a roll up on how 2019, 2019 did to 2018. We had almost a 9% increase in sales December over December, which is huge. Uh, and you can tell how huge it is because overall year to date, we only had about a 6% increase in 2019 total sales versus 2018 total sales. Now to be clear, this is the Austin and Round Rock market, which um, is roughly about 80% of the total sales that happen in this area. Uh, so there, there's even more even beyond this. This just gives you an idea how those specific markets are doing as well. Uh, average price, holy heck, 11% uh, increase December over December, which is quite unusual. Uh, year to date was an increase of 3.6%. Medium price saw a 7.3% increase year over year in December and a 3.3% uh, increase overall for the 2019 year versus the 2018 year. The one market segment that we did see a decrease in was the condo segment. Uh, so the condo segment, even though they had a positive decem December, saw a negative uh, year over year at uh, a, a decrease of 2.6% in terms of the total sales. Now, the townhouse market had a larger decrease in terms of year over year sales, but again, the condo market uh, is, is the larger part of the condo and townhome market, so not as uh, big of an issue. Although they do say that condos and townhomes are the canary in the coal mine. They're the first market segment to go down when the market goes down. They're the last market segment to go up when the market goes up. So this is something we're watching. Uh, again, as the appetite and demographic has shifted more towards multifamily condos, right? Uh, I'm, I'm, it's not something I'm worried about for at least the next 12 to 18 months, but it is something that we have been watching um, as we've seen some of those decreases there. We're seeing bigger decreases, for example, in the Houston market, uh, where in the Houston market, the number of townhome sales has been down uh, roughly nine of the last 12 months. And uh, Houston is building, Houston builds, Austin builds condos, Houston builds townhomes, just kind of how, they build condos too, but uh, you just see more uh, condo, uh, excuse me, more townhome uh, sales in Houston, but they are seeing a dramatic decrease in that market uh, there in the Houston uh, area. For the days on market, right now we're at about 59 days on market uh, for the month of December and 55 days on market on average throughout 2019. Uh, we have about 2,300 pending sales, which is roughly what our our number of sold properties were in December, so that's forecasted a great month for us in January, and I'll show you how great it was in the next slide. And right now, again, this is just for the Austin and Round Rock market. We are at a 1.8 month supply of inventory. Uh, so basically, properties are being put on the market and sold uh, multiple offers above list price, in some cases, the same day that those houses are listed. So. It's, it's both good and bad, it is a disruption. So if you're selling, it's fantastic, unless you have to go and buy another replacement property, right? Uh, so so that's, that's kind of the thing that we always have to kind of work with and deal with. Uh, these are the numbers for January, so the year-to-date numbers are the same as January. Uh, but we saw an 8.5% increase in year-over-year -year closed sales. Uh, we sold almost 2,000 units here in the Austin market in January. Uh, average price was up 1% to $373,000 and medium price up 4.8% to $308,000. All of the classes, uh, including uh, uh, townhouses or flat but condos, uh, were up 8.3%, so all of the asset classes were up, were positive. Uh, single family building permits, you can see where we've been uh, 
in terms of building single family houses going back to 1980. Uh, as you can see, the 80s savings and loan boom, savings and loan bust, uh, the dot com boom, the dot com bust, the credit boom, the credit bust, and the current market cycle that we're in now. We're still not building as many houses as what we built in the last market cycle, but we are selling more houses, uh, which is this blue line right here, than what we sold. We're selling more houses today, that blue line, than what we sold in the last market cycle. So again, our production is not keeping up with our demand uh, from uh, the single family housing standpoint. When it comes to multifamily, again, you can see the the savings and loan boom and bust in the 80s. You can see how long we were down in terms of uh, us building back multifamily. And you can see that we are as close as ever as building as many houses as what we built in, in or excuse me, as much multifamily as what we built in 1984. And uh, we are building more in terms of multifamily in uh, 2019 than what we built in the 2000. Uh, three, four, five, and six market cycles as well. The cap rates for those multifamilies are incredibly low, uh, which is a good thing if you are selling, it is a bad thing if you are buying. When you have low cap rates, what that means is basically you're paying more money today, meaning a higher price for that asset for those future cash flows that are coming in. So cap rate is a function of net operating income and sales price. So as the sales price starts to go up and those cash flows stay about the same, then that cap rate starts to drop. As prices go down and those asset, that net operating income stays the same, cap rates start to go up. When we're buying, we want to buy at high cap rates. When we're selling, we want to sell at low cap rates. Right now, everything that people are buying are at these incredibly low cap rates, which means they're paying more uh, for those future streams of, of, of net operating income uh, than, than normal. So what does that mean? Uh, so, so 10 years ago, for example, you may have paid somewhere between uh, 50 and $60,000 a door for an apartment, uh, and a, for each door in an apartment building in Austin. Today, you're spending over $100,000 a door for that same apartment building. And have rents gone up? Yes, but have they doubled? No. Uh, but is there more, is there higher occupancy? Yes, or a vacancy? Yes. Is there a change in the demographic and we don't have, again, enough multifamily right now? The answer is yes, yeah. So the forecast for 2020, and uh, to see some of us just joining us, uh, forecast for 2020, we expect here in the Austin market an increase in the average, uh, an increase in the number of sales that we have, somewhere in the three to five percent range. Uh, we also expect an increase in the average and median price up three to five percent. So a good market, a strong market for us here in Austin, and it's pretty similar throughout the rest of Texas as well. Uh, we are watching some of those different issues that may uh, 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 cause us to either have a speed up or a slow down. But again, as all the people are moving here, uh, they have to have a place to live as real estate investors. I'm very happy to provide that. Uh, moderate but healthy growth uh, into 2020. And then again, for those of you guys who are joining us online, on our Facebook live feed, you guys can get uh, membership to the Real Estate Investor Association, uh, get information like what we've shared today, plus much more, by going to texasreas.com, Texas, R-E-I-A-S, uh, that stands for Real Estate Investment Associations, uh, texasreas.com, you can join uh, in our membership for only $100, it's a six month membership. Uh, that includes being able to go to our next three-day training class, which is a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, March 24th, 25th, 26th at the Omni South Park. And of course, our members get our uh, blueprint, which is actually a two-foot uh, or a three-foot wide by two-foot tall blueprint, going over the 273 different things that we've learned about real estate investing since we started investing back in 2003. This is the basis for the foundation for material that we go over at our three-day training. I'd love to be able to share that with uh, you guys online if you uh, join uh, us in membership. 
Now, some people also ask me for a copy of my slides and all of my backup material that I use to make the slides. I would be happy to share with you and give you the hours and hours and hours of work that I have put into this presentation. I don't know if you can tell or not, but there's some time spent on this, okay? Uh, I'd be happy to give you uh, the summary, which is what I presented to you guys today, as well as all the backup material that went into this. I just ask that you make a donation to Habitat for Humanity, the Austin Habitat for Humanity. Now, to be clear, this has no financial impact on me. This is a charitable donation that you take on your own tax return, not mine. But it is intentionally congruent with all things real estate, and it is intentionally congruent with providing houses. It's intentionally congruent with something that I'm very, I'm very passionate about, which is people who are willing to put in the work, the thousand plus hours to help build this house, with combined with the donations to find to 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 create housing for people who otherwise might not be able to get it. So if you would be open enough to make a donation, I'm just asking for a hundred dollar donation. I will send you all my slides, all the backup material. Uh, just send an email to info at riaaustin.com and I will be or info at texasrias.com and I'd be happy to share with you uh, uh, everything that I've put together over the course of this uh, presentation. Now, if you are too cheap to do that, <laughs> and I know who you are because you're going to take a picture of this slide right now, or a screenshot <laughs> of this slide right now, you can go and do all of the hours and hours worth of work on your own and compile it yourself by getting the source data from all these different places. But I'd much rather uh, uh, let me do that work for you. It's done. And uh, uh, allow you to be charitable in your heart and make a difference for someone who is in uh, the community within which we work. So thank you guys for being here with me tonight. And we'll see you at the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you.